sentence to myself. My name is Markus Nemet. I'm from Anton Paar in Germany. I'm here with, yeah, with the Rheology team for the past 12 years and I'm doing international trainings and installations, uh, seminars, um, as well as demos like this one and yeah, work in the product support team to help um, our partners as well as our users in terms of application requests, software settings and so on. So um, let's start with the presentation right away. Uh, sorry, Marcus. Uh, yes. uh, the voice is clear. Um, and you you might have some problems. Share uh, screen. Oh, the share screen is not yet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's not yet. Okay, here. thank you. So I will I will right. share now. Yes. All right. So I haven't started the presentation yet. Let's move on. Um, yeah, so very welcome to our food rheology um, short webinar, uh, where we as well will play around a little bit with the rheometrist later on. Um, so let's hop in right away. Where does rheology help us with yeah, development, processing, um, answering questions about our um yeah any anything in the process of making foods so if you have a dough if you have any sauce a paste a gel like sample a solid stiff material if you want to know the influence of temperature to it of uh, the pumpability shearing the sample um yeah filling it etc cetera, etc cetera. so all of that can be checked with rheological problem uh, uh, yeah, measurements on a rheometer. So if it be in the formulation that you want to see the influence of specific uh, ingredients to the composition, like additives, different stabilizers, gelins, stuff like that, <clears throat> there you could run regular viscosity uh, measurements, flow behavior of the flow formulation, uh, viscoelasticity, uh, gel strength, stuff like that can be measured if you want to know how your sample behaves in production if you want to mimic your production process you can check as well for the flow behavior for the viscosity or the viscoelasticity the stiffness of a sample um, you can check for the storage is it how's the sedimentation stability how's the thermal stability uh, and for sure application uh, and usage yeah, flow behavior under shear conditions in the application if someone eats it and so on thixotropy structure recovery of a ketchup for example uh, those are the things we are looking at and yeah let's have an idea of how to measure where do we come from what is a rheometer and so on so in that case let's jump in what is viscosity or what is rheology? So rheology is the science or the way to measure the viscoelastic properties of any material. From liquid to solid, anything can be measured. Um, there we might find like the viscoelastic liquids, we might find viscoelastic solids, ideal elastic solids or ideal uh, ideal viscous liquids. So from left to right, the viscosity increases when the sample gets more and more stiff. Uh, but for sure, if you have something solid, like here symbolized by the Eiffel Tower or any other solid building, um, there we have an ideal elastic material. So you would not anymore shear the sample. If you shear a sample, if you pump it, if you let it flow, et cetera, et cetera, the sample moves, the sample is pumped or whatever. So there we would measure in a rotational way with a rheometer and we measure our ideal viscous liquids 
like if you have just an oil, if you have a, uh, a very low viscous concentrated uh, solution, or you might have if you increase different ingredients, uh, content of solid particles, if you create a weak, uh, a little bit of a gelant, uh, higher viscosity, stiffer sample, but it still flows like honey, for example. There we run into the viscoelastic liquids. Yeah, so here uh, symbolized in that way. So over time, the sample is still flowing. Whilst if we go further to the right, we have the viscoelastic solids. Yeah, like I have uh, brought with me today a ketchup and a hummus uh, to play a little bit around and measure stuff like that. And there we are usually speaking about like a gel or paste like material, but it's still by applying an outside force can be deformed and uh, it can be um, moved. So in that case, we speak about uh, samples which have a yield point. So where we can apply force and let them flow. For sure, at a certain point, uh, the samples are too solid and we would break them or our instruments would stuck and cannot move anymore. And we would just start to toss out the sample from uh, the instrument. In that case, we would switch to another test type. And this is an oscillatory test where we measure um, uh, in, an, in an oscillatory motion where we get then, uh, we tickle out the behavior of our sample um, in two terms. So we get the viscous part and the elastic part in oscillation. And then we are able to measure even solid-like samples. Uh, so we have users, for example, they play around with um, solid cookies, yeah, like the break, the brittleness of them, but they measure as well different uh, humidity conditions and stuff like that with those samples. So you see a rheometer, like we have here one, and we will see them later on as well in, in uh, on the screen. A rheometer can measure any type of sample. We just need, I distinguished measuring geometry to it, yeah, for solids, we need a fixture. For liquids, we might need a cylindrical system or a plate or a cone or whatever. There are different types of geometries available. And so with the rheometer, uh, we can run measurements in rotation and oscillation. For sure, there are different types of rheometers, so smaller ones and larger ones. So the smaller ones are... Uh, more used for rotatory easy tests, and the larger ones are as well used for uh, dynamic mechanical analysis, uh, so torsion tests and tear tests and stuff like that. So a wide range is possible. For sure, temperature is as well a very uh, important thing if you want to compare your product, which is stored in a refrigerator, um, you want to know the behavior at eight degrees. And maybe if you have that on the plate on your breakfast table, you want to know how the sample behaves there at around ambient conditions. Uh, but as well, you might want to know how it behaves when you eat it or if you store it not um, in a climatized room. So the temperature will increase during the day and decrease at night. So you want to know how the um, the sample's behavior changes there. For sure, you need to the rheometer a certain temperature device control, uh, special accessories we will see later. And for example, here we have a lower plate and an active hood on top, so we have perfect temperature. So we can either use a Peltier system, we can use convection temperature control, so um, with radiation and um, yeah, convection air, electrical heated systems up to 400 degree are possible. The convection ones can go to 1000. I guess possibly that's not the case for food products, but <laughs> who, you never know. And then for sure the, um, let's say easy and a bit outdated one is a liquid temperature control. And what else we need? So we have our instrument, we have the um, lower or we have an, an, a temperature control uh, accessory and then we need a geometry. Geometries can come in many different shapes. Um, we will see later on as well some special shaped geometries. 
there are some norms available. Uh, ISO 3219 is one of them, and they describe absolute measuring geometries. So if you have a stirrer, it is a relative one. If you have a um, plate or a cone or a concentric cylinder, that's an absolute geometry. So the benefit of absolute geometries is it doesn't matter which um, size they have. If you have a small cylinder or a large cylinder, if you have um, yeah, a certain um, size comparison, then you get exactly the same measurements uh, between different uh, instruments or institutes. So you can measure comparable with others. Whilst if you have a, a stirrer or a not absolute measuring geometry, or if you use uh, very simple viscometers, they usually have just uh, the easy geometries, and then you measure not any more uh, absolute. So if you say, ah, the viscosity of my sample is 200 Pascal seconds, and in the lab next to you, someone uses a different geometry. They say, no, it's just 100 Pascal seconds. And then you have to figure out where does the difference come from. So as we said, different geometries with the cone and plate and the parallel plate. So they have the benefit of a very small sample volume. But if your sample tends to dry, you need to keep an eye on that. Whilst a cylinder is easy to fill, and easy to use, let's say, for, for um, standard measurements. Um, for sure, cleaning is a little bit more tricky here in that case. Um, yeah. Good. So we have now set up our rheometer. We have our geometries and our temperature device, and I will quick jump to the uh, video screen and I will switch on my, my camera. I hope you can see that now. <laughs> um, yes, we can see it. Yes, so we have here on, on the screen, we have two rheometers. Yeah, we have on the, um, wait a second if I can see that now. Uh, Ah, doesn't matter. So we have on the uh, on my left hand side um, we have the so called MCR ninety two. This is a a smaller lab um, rheometer where I have at the moment built in a so called cylindrical option. So here we can see we have a cylinder. In that one I have a so called disposable cup. Um, so benefit of this one is I can use it as a disposable. Um, so if I want to throw it away or wash it afterwards, so I have a higher throughput of samples, or if you are uh, working with, for example, yogurt, that could be uh, the yogurt itself could be grown inside in such a cup um, so that you can measure how stiff it is, right? And on top we have, we would use such a, so-called bob yeah this is a concentric cylinder which moves inside here we have then a gap of around one uh, millimeter at the side but as i said we have as well geometries like such a helical stirrer yeah where um you can yeah mix samples as well for sure, if you compare those results later on with others, is not, um, yeah, it's not so good or not so possible. All right. So here, on the other hand, we have our um, MCR 302 um, evolution. That's our uh, lightest rheometer at the moment, equipped with a lower plate. Um, we can have on top of that as well the hood. And here we would use different types of geometries. As I said already, we have, for example, such a cone. Uh, if you put that on the lower plate, you see it's wobbling around as it is really a cone with a, a tip, which is 
chopped off to avoid um, friction. What else would be possible? Um, maybe we measure with that one later. This is a so-called profiled plate. So here we have a serrated surface, um, especially for samples which are slippery. Um, that would be a very good option to avoid that the sample yeah, slips whilst um, um, yeah, the measurement is going on. So you can, it's, it's like, yeah, spikes like teeth is biting into the sample, holding it. Um, and you can measure then the solid like material. Marcus, so the, uh, the camera is not showing there as well. No, no camera. Yeah, I have to switch off the camera and right. I'm back right. on the uh, presentation again. Good. So what types of measurements can we perform? Uh, what type of tests can we do and what we will see now? So uh, very interesting. What is a rheometer measuring? As I said, we can measure the viscosity. What's the viscosity in short words? It's the resistance of our sample against an outside force. Um, so it doesn't want to flow or move or something like this, right? Um, for sure, if you have, if you take a uh, easy comparison, if you take a cooking oil, <laughs> uh, sesame oil or, or something like that, um, and you put a spoon inside, you can easily stir it. But it's, you need a little bit more force or it's yeah you need a little bit more yeah power in your arm to move that than if you would do that with plain water and if you try to do the same thing with honey it gets even harder let's say yeah because the honey has a higher viscosity so a higher resistance a higher inner friction and yeah so that inner friction is yeah can be translated to the viscosity and that is shear rate dependent so and in many types of samples, maybe not the oils, um, but as for example, a yogurt or the hummus or a ketchup or something like this, um, we have a shear rate dependent viscosity. That means the slower you move, the higher is the viscosity and the faster you stir it, the lower is the viscosity as we, yeah, break an inner structure, we get particles in orientation, et cetera. And that can be measured with this um, shear rate dependent viscosity as well. We can measure in oscillation um, <coughs> stiffnesses of uh, sort of like a gel strength measurement in an amplitude sweep or frequency sweep. We can measure um, setting behavior. We can do temperature tests, uh, be it heating or softing or uh, solidification, if you cool it, we can measure crystallization with an attached micros uh, microscope. We can do time dependent behavior, so uh, structure regeneration, uh, recovery of, um, for example, food coatings, uh, like, like if you have a, a spread which is applied, a frost or something like this. <laughs> that should level but not so much so as well that could be tested um, and you can measure for sure gel formation under different conditions time or temperature dependent measurements are possible and some other tests we will see later some special measurements to check for further um, behaviors so really just at the beginning this, so that we speak in the same language um if you know if i speak about shear rate and shear stress and viscosity that you know um what i'm talking about so here um we have our two plate model it's called yeah we have a base plate which is solid and stiff and immovable and the upper plate is moved by an outside force a motor for example right and so we know the area of the upper plate um, or of the cylinder um, and the, the cone or something like this. Um, that can be for sure uh, used to calculate the so-called shear stress. So we know the force, either we preset it or we can measure it. And we know the area and out of that we get the shear stress tau. 
force divided by area, the unit is Pascal. And whilst the upper plate is now moving, it moves with a certain velocity. And um, so we know that velocity or we can measure that velocity and we know the gap distance between the two plates and out of those uh, two <laughs> values, we calculate the shear rate, gamma dot. It's the velocity divided by the gap distance. So the unit is uh, meter per second divided by meter meters erased. So we have one per second or one reciprocal second. And yeah, one thing is we should have a laminar flow in there. Right, so shear rate, shear stress are used to uh, calculate then the shear or previously sometimes called dynamic viscosity eta. So we have eta here is shear stress divided by shear rate and the unit is then pascal seconds um, or millipascal seconds. Sometimes you still see CP or centipoise. Um, yeah, you can uh, calculate one in another. So one centipoise is one millipascal second. Um, so that's a quite easy way to go forth and back. And now a typical measurement of the rheometer is either presetting the shear rate, measuring the resulting shear stress and calculating the viscosity or vice versa. We preset the shear stress measuring the shear rate and get the viscosity as well. And so there are three typical behaviors you can find um, in such tests for sure. Um, Different um, different samples might have a slight um, mixture of those behaviors, but as an overview, you could say if, if the sample doesn't show any change, so we increase the shear rate here, uh, it doesn't change its viscosity, it's an ideal viscous or Newtonian sample. In that case, um, that's usually and an oil, for example, or honey in a liquid state or stuff like that. Whilst most of the samples we see, they show a behavior like number two, increasing the shear rate leads to a decreasing viscosity. So the higher uh, or the stronger we shear, the lower gets the viscosity of the sample. Seldom, usually only in very high concentrated particle suspensions, we see a so-called shear thickening effect. Yeah? So the viscosity is increasing with an increasing shear rate, which is usually not so often seen in, in a food product or an in industry. Uh, you could play around with it. And if you take starch, pure, plain uh, starch, 50% in water, uh, you would get such a sample. All right, just an overview here, for example, we've measured water. Uh, in a so-called double gap, which is a, a, a double gap cylinder. And there we see we have a constant viscosity. So you see on the y-axis, we have the viscosity. On the x-axis, the shear rate. And here, just to see the measured shear stress. And so we have a constant viscosity as we have a linear increasing shear stress curve, right? Um, yeah, so water has at 20 degree a viscosity of one millipascal second, which can be clearly seen here in this example. As I said, an oil would have a would have yeah behave similar, whilst most of the times, if we speak about food products, we have dispersions, emulsions, suspensions, stuff like that. And there we see something, uh, especially uh, in, in, in different types of graphs, a shear thinning if, uh, effect. So here we have a linear scaled diagram where the focus is more on the higher shear rates, whilst if we jump one uh, slide back, the diagram here is scaled in a logarithmic way, so the focus is more on the low shear rates, uh, just as a side input. So. Uh, what do we have here? Two oil in water emulsions. The filled markers so are um, a typical yeah, emulsion, whatever it is. And there we see if we start to shear, we have a steep drop of the viscosity and then a flattened curve. Whilst um, if we add 10% of water, 
to the sample, you see we have a little bit of a lower viscosity throughout. That means now we have an oil and water emulsion. If we have more water, the oil droplets in uh, our emulsion have uh, more space around them. So there's less interaction, less in a friction and therefore a lower viscosity. Yeah, but clearly seen a very steep drop of the viscosity initially for typically for dispersions. And out of that, we can read a lot of things because if you want to uh, tell something about, yeah, my sample is always stuck or it's not flowing so fast. So maybe you can increase the force of the pump, pump it faster and the viscosity will drop down to a lower value and it will flow fast easier uh, with less effort, for example. Uh, so you can check for different application ranges and pumpability, for example. So where does it come from that we see that steep drop of the viscosity is in a suspension or emulsion. We have particles or droplets. They are at rest, suspended uh, randomly. If you start to shear them, they get oriented in the shear field and flow easier. The same applies for agglomerated samples. Uh, if you have agglomerates from primary particles, they crash into each other or you break them up, you get um, smaller particles. Uh, they can fly away um, easier from each other. Um, there is not so much, or there's less interaction um, and therefore a lower viscosity uh, as a result. And in an emulsion, for example, we will see a picture of that later. At rest, the emulsion uh, or emulsified droplets are uh, spherical. If you start to shear them, they get um, stretched to ellipsoids, for example. And then again, we have less inner friction and so a lower viscosity. Um, here I have an example for um, that was a hair gel and a shampoo, but it behaves very, very, or not very, it is actually uh, similar to um, standard um, gelants. So in the, in the shampoo, there is like a, a gelant inside and in the hair gel and in the, sorry, in the hair gel is a gelant and in the shampoo, we have surfactants. And what you see, for example, they have completely different behavior. So, um, the shampoo shows a constant viscosity and then a shear thinning behavior. So here we have polymer molecules or surfactants which are disentangling and getting stretched before they start to sh show shear thinning, whilst the hair gel shows a so-called yield point. So if the viscosity, for example, is going up, 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 if we go to smaller shear rates, then uh, that indicates a yield point so that this sample is stable um, at rest. Uh, very interesting, uh, here at around shear rate 20 to 30 to 40 to 50, so in that range, the viscosity is uh, very uh, similar, which is wanted because that's the application range when you would have the sample on your hand, right? And there, or you apply to your hair. And there, it should behave very similar. But yeah, the hair gel should stay whilst the shampoo should be washed out at a certain point. Right. Um, that can be translated for sure as well to food products. So, like, if you if you think of spoonability of a cream of a yogurt or something like this, or do you need a knife to get it out of a, a, a box? Like, if you have a spread. Um, spread cheese do you need a knife to get it out or a spoon or is what is the application is it intended that uh, a person is eating it or uh, stuff like that so as we spoke about the yield point that can be measured how much force very important point where how much force do you need in order to let the sample flow so that is the yield point in principle at rest we have a physical interacting structure. Uh, we have particles uh, grinding on top of each other. There is solid, solid friction. We have weaker forces, hydrogen bridges or whatever. Uh, by applying an outside force, yeah, shearing the sample, 
we break that structure. And how much force is needed to break it? That can be measured by presetting now the shear stress and measuring the shear rate. And if the sample comes from the origin out, we just have a shear thinning behavior. Uh, but without a yield point, whilst if we have an intersection, inter, um, yeah, crossover point intersection with the y-axis, that would uh, indicate the yield point. So that's the minimum force you need to let the sample flow, let it uh, yeah, squeeze it out of a tube, um, apply force with a, uh, a spoon or something like that. Yeah, uh, There are different ways to analyze that. For example, we can do this uh, Bingham flow curve, uh, wind tub for chocolates, for example. Casson is often used in the food uh, sector and Herschel Barkley. There are different models and different models lead. So, so these are um, mathematical regressions. Uh, so you have a curve and there's a mathematical formula which tries to fit that curve to the mathematical for formula and you get different results out of that. So here, for example, we measured <clears throat> uh, chocolate melts, yeah, a bitter, a white and a whole milk chocolate. And you see if we analyze according to Wintab and according to Casson, you get different results for the shear stress. Um, or the yield point. So in that case, uh, this is a very important thing to keep in mind. The yield point is not necessarily a material constant, but because it as well depends on your analysis method. Um, nevertheless, it gives you a very good idea. And if you use always the same, uh, it's usually um, working very well. Another way is by plotting the deformation. So the deformation is not anymore like the shear rate. Shear rate measures how fast is the upper plate going. Um, the deformation measures how far, so the traveled distance of the upper plate. And in that case, that would be here, for example, a measurement of a ketchup where there's an, uh, um, an additive used in the blue one is uh, no additive. Uh, in the red one, we have an additional binder in it. And so in that case, you see here, for example, if the curve slope changes significantly, that's the yield point. And there you can see now, okay, question, yeah, which ketchup is the better one? And there is no real answer because I don't know the application. If my ketchup is now used in a uh, plastic bottle, for example, yeah, um, I can squeeze on that bottle, so possibly the one with the binder is better because I can squeeze it out and it stands uh, on the plate very nice, whilst the one without the binder uh, might level out very easily. And if you squeeze the bottle, it comes out um, in a rush, let's say. So in that case, um, depending on the application, you can make here comparisons on ingredients, on the formulation, um, on checks, as well as the later application. Will my customer be happy with the product or not? Something like this can be um, played around. So in rotation, we can do for sure more tests like temperature dependency comes later. Um, what else we can do is in oscillation, we can measure the so-called shear modulus. Now in oscillation, our upper plate is not any more going in one direction always. It's moving kind of forth and back and forth and back, left to right, uh, with a certain deformation. We measure the shear stress and we calculate the shear modulus. As in oscillation, it's a bit more complex. That's the complex shear modulus. Yeah? And here's some uh, Gs of Gs. So uh, in elasticity, we speak usually about stiffer samples. So we are in the kilopascal to megapascal uh, range in stiffness and brittleness. And all of that can be measured with the rheometer. Uh, all of these samples can be measured there. Uh, for sure, the cream cheese might be measurable in rotation, but all the others would not be measurable in a rotatory measurement, but can be measured in oscillation very well. Uh, and so in oscillation, as we said, uh, we measure the complex uh, shear modulus. And with a little bit of mathematics, um, we get two values out 
or three tangent delta as well. So we get two values. One is called G prime. One is called G double prime. And what is the benefit now? G prime stands for the elastic part of the sample. G double prime for the viscous part of the sample. So we have here a mixture in most of the samples between those two. And we can check now uh, is G double prime highly dominating over G prime? I have a liquid like sample. Is it dominating, but let's say in an order of, of 100 times higher maximum than we have a viscoelastic liquid? Uh, whilst if we have a solid like sample, we would only measure G prime. If we measure like a gel, now we would get G prime and G double prime. Now in the order of G prime being a hundred times higher than G double prime, then we would speak about a viscoelastic uh, gel-like sample or paste. And then a very important point would be here in the center, the point where G prime equals G double prime. And that's the point when uh, my sample's behavior changes. So if I have a gel, and I measure now and change something in our measurement preset and my sample gets liquid. That would be the point how much force, the shear stress at this point, how much force I need to let the sample flow, really flow. Yeah. Or if you cool something down, you get from liquid to solid, that would be the solid, uh, solidification point or a crystallization temperature, stuff like that. Uh, so that point um, is quite important and it is easy to uh, to analyze, right? So, because we have two values and we can say, okay, dear software, please tell me at which shear stress and shear strain value they are equal. Uh, there is no mathematical regression uh, required. Good. Um, so what do we measure in oscillation? We measure usually a so-called amplitude sweep where we get the dependency of G prime and G double prime over the deformation. So similar like the uh, viscosity measurement where we change the uh, shear rate, we can do the same thing with the shear uh, deformation. And then we get very interesting behaviors. On the first one, we see G prime over G double prime. So we have here a gel-like sample. Yeah, and this gel uh, at the beginning at small deformations, we have no change in the curve. So here, my measurement is so, how would you say that? So smooth or nice or gentle to the sample, it's not destroying it. It's kind of just wobbling it forth and back, uh, but not destroying the structure. So we can really say we measure here at rest. And then above a certain point, we see G prime dropping down and that would be the point when we start to break the inner structure of the sample, it gets weaker. Uh, and the crossover point is then when the sample starts to flow. Whilst if you have a liquid-like sample, there we have G double prime over G prime, it's liquid. And then at a certain point, G prime falls down. So the inner structure breaks further, but it's not initially not strong enough to give the sample an outer shape. Right, so here are, for example, uh, differences in starch gels. Here we have, um, measured two starch gels. Number one is a native corn starch. You see G prime um, is the squares and G double prime uh, the triangles. So the blue curve, you see G prime is bigger than G double prime. We have a gel. And then we, if we increase the deformation at a certain point, we see G prime breaking down very steep and G double prime peaking. So that's a typical behavior of a very strong superstructure. So we have here a hard and brittle sample. If you would try to uh, use a spoon on that and to, to, yeah, the spoonability of it, you would kind of cut in the sample, break it, and you have a wobbly bit of solid sample jelly material on your spoon. And if you eat that, it's usually breaking, it's kind of crumbling down. It's not really nice smoothing um, um, in that way. So compared to that, we see the um, G 
G-prime and G-double prime behavior of a modified waxy cornstarch. And there we see we have a lower G-prime value. That means we have a less stiff structure, so it's easier to spoon. And we see G-prime falling down more smooth, not such a strong peak of G-double uh, prime. So here we measure a very smooth and nice and um, easy to spoon sample so that the customer experience will be far better with this sample for example yeah um, what else you can check with the amplitude sweep is like um, concentration dependency so here we have starch gels in water at different concentrations and you see we see, uh, we have g prime and another well tension delta that's uh, the ratio between G double prime and G prime. So G prime, yeah, the higher the concentration, the higher the value. And then you can say, oh, I, I want to have a thousand Pascal from the stiffness. That's like our cream cheese, for example. So you know, okay, 7.5 Pascal is too low. 10 Pascal, 10% uh, is already a bit too high. So you would use something like um, 8, 9%, for example. Yeah. So you can use the rheology already in the lab in a small uh, with a small amount of sample you can already get uh, very good results and tentative results right what else you can uh, plot the uh, amplitude sweep over the shear stress the measured one and then we said the crossover point is our flow point and so you can here for example we have spread cheese at different temperatures and we check for um, the flow point of the sample uh, so that you can say how much force is needed. Is it okay? Is it pumpable? Yeah. Uh, if I have it in production at five degree and here I have something like um, two, three, four, four thousand five hundred Pascal, is my pump strong enough to get that sample pumped or is it just moving but nothing happens? Yeah? Stuff like that can be tested. Um, another um, let's say a use case here, we had a, uh, a stability check for um, milk drinks, which was quite interesting. So we had uh, for sure these um, milk drinks are a mixture of, of different ingredients, which are maybe not soluble in the milk. So in that case, you want to know a certain storage stability. For sure, it should not be storage stable for weeks and months or whatever. Um, but you want to have a, a stability um, for a certain time so that it's not falling out directly. And there you see, for example, we have um, measured uh, different, uh, first of all, the amplitude sweep. And there you see with pure milk, we had no G prime value. And then different, here is chalk budget, calcium enriched milk, and chalk plus. There we had higher and higher values. So it seems that this chalk plus uh, does not, it uh, does have the best stiffness and tendency against uh, sedimentation. And there you see as well, we did another test, which is called a frequency sweep, where we can say something about the time dependency. And pure milk, yeah, the tendency of G prime is very steep going down of this chalk milk standard is flat. And this calcium enriched milk and this chalk milk plus, they have a um, the least steep um, falling of the curve. So in that case here, we will have a longer stability of the sample. They will all settle. They will all show sedimentation for sure because they are liquid, um, but it will settle slower. So again, the customer experience will be better, for example. Yeah, what else we can do is we can do a so-called uh, time-dependent test, as we said. So we measure in the first interval, it's a three-interval test, first interval at rest. Then we shear the sample to simulate the application. And the third interval, we rest again. And we measure, for example, how does my catch-up behave? Yeah? Does it um, stand on the fries or does it level through, for example? Just a nice picture. Yeah. So here we had a dispersion, and you see we have G prime above G double prime. So we have a gel. We shear the sample, viscosity is dropping, and then the recovery takes place, and the viscosity goes. Uh, the the sample is liquid to that point, 
and then it's a gel again. So in process, in, that's the time, yeah, here a little bit longer. Uh, that's the time how long my sample can still flow and yeah, maybe show such a behavior or if it's short, it shows such a behavior. So dependent on uh, the need and your requirements, you can adapt this. Good, yeah. Um, as an overview as well, we can do temperature dependent tests. So we, we can increase or uh, decrease the temperature. And a general rule is the higher the temperature, the lower is the viscosity of a sample and vice versa. Like here, for example, that's uh, chocolate melt. And there you see if you cool down the sample at a certain temperature, we have a slope change when the cocoa butter starts to crystallize and getting solid and therefore the viscosity is increasing steeper. That can be used as a quality control measurement. Uh, if, you, if you have a supplier supplying you chocolate and you want to know if this is a good one or not good one, you want to have that point. Uh, because if you don't have that point, the supplier has taken out cocoa butter which is the expensive part of the of the chocolate and replaced it with a certain emulsion, which does not have uh, the crystallization temperature around this um, temperature. Yeah? So you could check how trustworthy your supplier is. <laughs> uh, what else we have here? Uh, measurements of an ice cream. Yeah, uh, the melting behavior to uh, two different ice creams melting and they see the blue one had the problem, it was not so nice to be separatable. Now the red one was far better to, yeah, so you can get your spoon in and a nice chop out. Uh, whilst the blue one was as well, it had a very strong mouth, a cold feel. So when you eat it, it's like cold, 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 cold liquid. Uh, whilst the other one was melting continuously, it gets smoother and smoother. And in the molten state, uh, in the mouth, it was then. Uh, more rich and creamy, uh, the red one. So you can as well compare co uh, sensory panel tests, for example, with um, your uh, with your tests here in the rheometer, and then predict will this be good or not good? Does my customer like it or not? Right. Uh, so far, we've measured with the standard plates and cones or cylinders. We have as well some special uh, geometries, for example, our uh, four wing steerer, which is usually used for, for often used for larger particle suspensions or uh, yogurt. Yeah? It kind of cuts in the sample and breaks it. Uh, and then you can, yeah, why is that important? Because if you have yogurt um, solid after, after it's growing, if you mix it, it's you break the structure permanently, uh, which is um, not so nice if you want to know how your sample behaves before you've broken the structure permanently. So in that case, as I said already, you can grow the yogurt in the cup and you use the stirrer inside, uh, which kind of cuts in the sample and then you can measure the stiffness, the flow point, the yield point of the sample with this um, stirrer for example yeah? as well you could use different types of stirrers or surface treatments um, or whatever in a in the yogurt cup itself in a so-called flexible cup holder which can be mounted on the rheometer um, so in production you can just grab one yogurt cup put it in there move in measure and you get your um, quality control test for example here we have an example of a so-called uh, ball measuring system uh, because often um, we have food products which have larger particles. Yeah, here it's on the right hand side a marmalade with uh, fruit pieces. Uh, we have users they have they produce ready to eat soups yeah, where they measure the viscosity for production of the liquid part. Uh, and found out it's not correlating with the real application. And then they measured the sample um, in this uh, ball meshing system where they had as well all the veg vegetables and, and noodles or whatever in, and they got comparable results and they could uh, modify their 
um, yeah, instrumentation and modify their application, for example. Yeah, so here, for example, a blueberry jam and a lemon jam, and you see the blueberries, maybe there's more blueberry solid particles in the blueberry one than lemon pieces in the lemon one. Um, but you can measure a flow curve over the whole shear rate range or over a wide shear rate range, and you see that the blueberry one has a higher uh, viscosity than the lemon one, and you can as well get different uh, test values and viscosities at different shear rates and so on. Yeah. Just to give you an idea what else is possible, uh, here we had a sauce um, bolognese and yeah, repeatability was very nice with this sample, for example. Uh, you can use the rheometer as well to measure a bit of penetration. Yeah that you use like a, a stirrer or a hollow stirrer or some a needle or whatever you want. And you see here, for example, um, we had over time the depth and we um, measured at different temperatures and there you see um, increasing the temperature led then to a uh, reducing of the depth and then you could pinch in the sample more and more as the temperature gets higher and higher and higher. Right, um, the same thing here, we have a, a plant margarine um, to do the same thing. So we move down and up to measure how much force is needed. And we get here the normal force, for example, how much force is needed to pinch in the sample and to move it out again, how much force is needed. Um, so stuff like that can be tested in order to uh, predict um, spreadability of the sample, uh, spoonability, or how the knife will, yeah, how much force is my user or the, the final applicant using um, to get the sample out, for example. Uh, what else we have? We have a microscope option. Why is that important or interesting? Let's say so. Um, we can measure the crystallization and we can follow the crystal growing, for example. Yeah? Um, or a flow behavior. Here we have um, silic uh, water in silicon oil droplets, um, just to make it visually a little bit easier and larger droplets available. And there you see if we increase the shear rate, we have a decreasing viscosity whilst the droplets get squeezed and stretched and stretched. And if we stop the shearing after high shear, it might happen that we break this droplet. So we can check here with a microscope as well for the um, for the emulsion stability at a certain point. Or um, I'm not sure if you if you can can see that uh, in real time. I just used now the oscillatory measurement. So here we follow a crystallization. That's a plant fat cooled from 60 to 25 degree. And the video is taken in that orange, yellowish range. And so you see over time, the crystals are growing and growing and growing, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And we've measured here with uh, polarized light to visualize these uh, particles. The black dot in the center is just an air bubble. So. We <laughs> That was by mistake in the sample, so we moved in there to play around a little bit. Right. Yeah, so things like that are possible. Um, in rotation, I'm not sure if that will come out very good um, with the slow internet connection. But in rotation, it gets more and more misty and cloudy as these particles are growing bigger and bigger and bigger. And you can see. Yes. yes. Uh, sorry for interruption. Uh, excuse me, all. Can you please uh, mute your microphones while uh, while the lecture is being presented? Thank you. Okay. Sorry. Good. Um, yeah, so here in the video, we see um, the crystals growing and you can as well visualize how these crystals form clusters and interact with each other and uh, rush into each other 
and kind of clump up and the, which is then the reason why the viscosity is increasing. Right, yeah. So you see already the rheometer has a wide range of possibilities, not only to measure daily standard tests, but as well uh, research for stuff with a microscope, or we have here a, a tribological measurement. So tribology measures the friction of uh, a contact. So for example, we have here a base plate, we have a ball, that's a negative pyramid, like up here, yeah, and the ball rotates. And in between, we can have a very thin film of something, yeah? uh, like we've measured here, um, mouthfeel of uh, mayonnaise, yeah. And we had, uh, there you see on the first hand, we had rheology, we've uh, compared, sorry, we, we compared um, the regular rheology, the flow points, and <clears throat> the, yeah, the black curve had the highest flow points, um, the air, uh, and the, uh, sorry, the red curve had the highest flow points um, with the 25% oil, whilst the one with the highest amount of oil had the lowest flow points. Um, and in the tribological measurements, we could compare that. So the mouthfeel tribology is when you swallow that. So the higher the fat content as expected, the lower is the friction. And so you can as well say something on the one hand with rheology and tribology about, for example, the bite force, the mouthfeel, the uh, swallow behavior. So you can, in a certain way, use rheology and this tribology option as well <clears throat> to predict um, the mouthfeel of a sample. So you can already reduce the amount of samples which are going to a... Um, to a sensory panel, which is usually quite expensive to handle uh, for a new product. Uh, as well, additionally, we can measure, for example, the gelation of starch, either under uh, ambient conditions, or we can pressurize the whole thing to avoid the sample from boiling. And then you can see, for example, here, that's a, a, a simple cornstarch. Uh, gelation very high, then it breaks down, and then we have cold gelation. Whilst here we have a this resistant starch, so here uh, we don't have this overshoot falling down. So different starches have different uh, gelation uh, ranges and behavior, and so you can compare there the influence of different types of samples. Yeah, whilst here we have the benefit of this pressure cell. Here we heat it up to 100 degree, and there you see in an open system for sure the sample start the water starts to boil, and therefore we have this uh, noisy behavior and the gel is not as strong as it would have been whilst we have it here under four bar, and we have here the curve typically for such a starch gelation, right? Good. Uh, just it, it was really a quick course um, because we will. I want to as well play a little bit with the rheometers as well together with you. Um, if you want to know more about rheology, you can always contact me or Mohamed or as well. We have a applied rheology book in a very easy, simple way explaining rheology in different types of uh, languages. Unfortunately, not in not yet translated to Arabic, but um, maybe in the future will come as well. All right, um, Mohamed, should we, before we do some measurements, do now the Q&A session for the presentation or? Sure, Marcus. Uh, thank yeah. you so much for uh, this informative and very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, and thank you, uh, attendees. Uh, we are not uh, uh, to the end of our presentation yet. شكرا لكم جميعا حضوركم و دلوقتي احنا عندنا سيشن عشان الاسئله والاجوبه لو في اي سؤال انتم محتاجين احنا احنا نجاوبه ممكن تسالوه بالعربي او بالانجليش واحنا نقدر نجاوبكم. Uh, لو في اي شيء مش واضح احنا نقدر نوضحه. احنا بعد 
بعد ما نشوف اسئلتكم هنشوف الجهاز وهو احنا بنشتغل عليه عينات قدامكم فهل في اي سؤال اوكي استاذ محمد الامور كلها تمام ان شاء الله شكرا شكرا استاذ نور All right. Uh, it seems uh, there are uh, no questions yet. So, uh, Marcus, uh, we can continue our session. All right. All right. Thank you. Good. So, um, I will share quick our uh, the software. Um, I hope you're seeing the video still. and so we can play around so i don't see the video anymore because i'm sharing the screen <laughs> um but that should be fine so first of all the overview of the software we have our rheometer here and we can measure let's just measure a plane uh flow curve yeah and i will get my catch up So in the software, we can do different things. We can um, program our test pro uh, our profile. For example, here we can preset a temperature if we want to measure at a certain temperature, um, stuff like that. And we can set our uh, measurement. Uh, here we have a linear ramp, for example, or we can do the same thing with a logarithmic ramp. That's better in my opinion um, um so you can here for example define at which temperature you want to measure uh eight degrees 20 degrees something like this if you say i don't need that you can just delete it and then we can measure here the viscosity uh from point one for example to 100 reciprocal seconds and with the time delay, that's fine. And then here, for example, we have a standard regression for Herschel Bulkley and an interpolation for the viscosity at shear rate 50, for example. Yeah. And yeah, so let's start first of all measuring geometry and the uh, I have here just a catch up and I will fill that. I'm not sure if you can see that. Yeah, so squeezing it out. That would be actually not the best way to apply your sample. Just for the shortage of time, I will do it now. Um, because um, your material might be, or as it is pre sheared, it uh, might not recover in a reasonable time. Nevertheless, let's start to do that. Uh, connect the meshing geometry. The instrument recognizes all the geometry and uh, the meshing um, cell and all of that. And I can then Go to measuring position here on the right hand side and whilst it's moving down we'll just grab some paper so that was for sure a little bit too much sample <laughs> um that happens uh marcus uh, excuse me uh, yes. you are just sharing the screen or opening the video i i had the video open but it can be that if uh, i'm not sure how uh, uh i can i cannot share with teams my screen whilst i'm um showing how the the test uh, behaves so can can we please uh, show the uh, the video and then and then we come back to the uh, yeah sure to the screen thank you thank you
So the rheometer is now moved in uh, to the sample. I have uh, a little bit too much sample in there. So that's for sure too much for the next time I need less. Um, the, the cups have as well a mark inside to show you how, how deep you need to, or, or how much sample is uh, necessarily. Um, that's the wrong camera, that's me. Good. So let's go back to the presentation, uh, to the software, and let's run the test. Uh, catch up. And see how it behaves. Yeah. So here I get a warning that the motor adjustment is um, too old. That's just a warning. Um, a motor adjustment helps us to, let's say, it's kind of a small maintenance which you as the user can perform to keep your instrument uh, yeah, measuring correct and uh, still precise. Because those instruments, you have to keep in mind, they are uh, very high precise. If you think, um, if you stretch your arm and you would put a dust corn on the tip of your finger, it falls on the tip of your finger. If you, with this additional weight, your arm moves down a little bit, and that's the resulting torque of around one micronewton meter, and we can measure in the nanonewton meter range with the larger instruments. So these instruments are extremely sensitive and can measure really, really uh, very precise, and with this motor adjustment, you can perform that precision measurement as well. But nevertheless, what do we see? We have two graphs. On the left-hand side, we have the viscosity over the shear rate. Yeah? And we see here a shear thinning behavior. Yeah? And on the right-hand side, we have the graph where the curve uh, goes up, up, up. And then we have the that's just a report which will be printed out after each measurement and so here we have the curve and the analysis according to Herschel Barclay says there is a 59 pascal yield point in the sample right so that is a typical analysis for that good um, I will run this test another time but leave the um, so that you can see how it's actually moving. So here's the video, and I will start the test in the background again. And you can tell me, <laughs> when do you think that the test has started? So we are already at measuring point number four. Yeah. Most hard. Uh, the most. Yeah. Uh, most. Sorry. Mr. Lord, can you please uh, mute your microphone? Yeah. 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 Uh, sorry. Yeah, that's fine. Now you see that it's very slowly. Uh, Marcus, I muted all. Can you please continue talking? Yeah. So uh, you can unmute yourself. Yes. Um, so now you see how the uh, sample is rotating. Um, so in that case, that happens uh, very late. Yeah. 
So one thing is shear rates below one cannot be seen with the human eye and therefore are usually not, um, yeah, not measurable um, or comparable. Uh, sorry, they are measurable, but you cannot see them, and so usually uh, hard to compare. <laughs> okay, let's, for the shortage of time, let's hop to um, the second rheometer, yeah, uh, where we will measure a little bit of um, our hummus, and I will play it with the serrated upper plate. And first of all, I will connect the measuring geometry. Yeah, very easy. It's just connecting it. There's no force needed, and the uh, instrument recognizes um, the measuring geometry over this. Is it blurry? Now it should be better over that chip in the uh, geometry. Uh, so there's nothing what you have to do manually in the software playing around forth and back. And yeah. So with the humus, which is uh, solid, I would rather run a test in oscillation and so you've seen the software and i guess you will let's apply so first of all we have to set a so-called zero gap so that the instrument knows where is the lower plate or uh, because there we measure in distances in the micrometer range so that's as well quite uh, interesting and important. Uh, so now the geometry moves down until it touches the lower plate. So this is how the instrument measures it. Good, so now it's in position and we can start a measurement later on. So how to apply it, we'll just raise um, the head and Use a spatula. Yeah, and now, wait a second, I need to see what I'm doing. Yeah, so, yeah, now I take just a, a little bit of that, apply to the lower plate, and I move into measuring position again, <laughs> which is with the plate around one millimeter. For sure, that's far too much sample. It's just to show you um, how the whole thing um, behaves. Wonderful. So now it asks me to trim the sample. That means to take away the excess. Yeah, so I take the spatula and scrap. As you see, that's not rotating. So in that case, it is blocked. So I can really trim away the entire amount of sample, which is excess. So I just have the sample under the plate. For sure, this material is, is not perfectly homogenized. We have some air bubbles in there, um, but I will measure it like this anyway, because that's the way how the sample is at the customer or the user side. So in that case, um, I will not make it perfect. Um, but yeah, 
measure it how it is at the customer side. Good, so whilst the test is running, I can start to sh or I can show you how the measurement looks like. Oh. So here we have on that uh, graph on the left hand side, we have G prime and G double prime, like in the presentation, the square is the um, yeah, is G prime, the elastic part, G double prime, the viscous part. So here we have uh, G prime above G double prime. And on the right hand side, we have the same thing up, uh, placed above the shear stress. And now I, I started at 0.1% uh, deformation. Um, usually I would start uh, lower because we've reached with 0.1% um, deformation already the end of the LVE range. And you see how G prime and G double prime are falling down and or G prime is falling down actually that means our small deflection our small stress as well yeah we have the range of 10 pascal beginning um, is starting to destroy the inner structure of the sample more and more and more but we have still a gel like material yeah it's still uh, solid to this point it's not flowing Let's see how it's proceeding. Yeah, so as expected, we have now uh, two prime coming down and the sample is getting softer and softer and I guess around 80 to 90% uh, uh, Pascal, we will see the crossover point. So you see on the right hand side, we have a steep drop of the curve. That's due to the inner structure breaking. And we have a, a logarithmic scaled um, shear stress curve. And now we are hitting at around 80 Pascal, 90 Pascal, 87. Um, the crossover point, so my sample gets now liquid or it's not liquid like water, yeah, it's not like a, for sure. But now we come in the range where we have the spreadability of it. Uh, so this is now the force, what you need at least to spread it over or to, yeah, let it flow, to dosage it. So your dosing unit needs to be as well able to apply this force, um, <laughs> otherwise, it's not coming out of the dosing unit, for example. Yeah. So stuff like that is possible. And now we are really in the more liquid stage. Um, oh, looking quite nice, actually. Uh, so these are typical tests, viscosity measurements, um, oscillatory measurements for um, deformation, for flow behavior of the sample, um, yield point, yield strength, flow point, stuff like that. Oh, that's my uh, analysis. Um, yeah, so here this curve, uh, the analysis says 87% um, is the uh, flow point, for example. And yeah, with that value, that's not regressed, that's just a crossover point. With that value, you can really play around and have, um, yeah, you can use this as well as an um, development value as an idea you can say if g prime is higher than a certain value uh, um, the sample is too stiff or too hard or um, too flexible uh, stuff like that so 
Rheology helps you in a wide range, as I said, in the shortage of time. Um, I showed you two standard measurements, but we can do as well far more complex stuff, like you can have waiting times, you can have shear intervals, right? So you can, um, if we have a look at the measurement, at the moment we have one interval, but you could uh, add different intervals, for example, uh, so you can have your waiting time, a shear, a pre-shear, a temperature increase at the same time, right? I can add here, for example, the temperature and say whilst, um, so beforehand, I want to have a temperature of 20 degree, and then I, it should, uh, yeah, I want to have a ramp from 20 uh, to 40 degree or something like this. Yeah, so you can play around with the presets as well. Very easy, uh, change stuff like that. And yeah get tickle out, rheologically seen everything from your sample. Good. Questions from your side about the rheometer, the measurements we saw, or to the presentation? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the presentation was very straightforward and really nice. Thank you, Marcus. And uh, I'd like to ask the attendees, uh, please, if you have any question, you can ask now or later if you want in my WhatsApp or uh, my email, so I can uh, answer you anytime. Shukran likum gamian hudurkum liyum. Lo mahtagin ayi tawdih aw ayi asila mumkin tisaluna hina. Mumkin tiftahu microphone utikallimu. Mumkin tiktabu fil chat box. Uh, ممكن تبعتوا لي على الواتساب أو على الإيميل وإحنا نجاوبكم إن شاء الله uh, مجال الريولوجي uh, يعني يعتبر فيه ثلاثة أو أربع شركات على مستوى العالم هم اللي شغالين فيه uh, أنتم بار هي من uh, رواد هذا المجال وعندهم براءات اختراع كتير متعلقة بالمجال ده يعني اختصارا uh, هو يتعلق بقوام uh, المادة ولزوجتها طبعا احنا لما نيجي نتكلم عن اللزوجه فاحنا بنتكلم عن مقاومه جزيئات الماده لبعضها وعلى العوامل الخارجيه المؤثره عليها العوامل الخارجيه تشمل اي قوه مؤثره على الماده تشمل درجه الحراره تشمل الضغط فعند تاثير هذه العوامل على اي ماده المفروض ان هي بتتغير وقوامها بيتغير ولزوجتها بتتغير إلا بعض المواد التي تسمى بالنيوتونيان فلويدز زي المية هي لزوجتها مش بتتغير أما المواد التانية اسمها نون نيوتونيان فلويدز وهي مواد بتتغير لزوجتها بتغير العوامل المؤثرة عليها في مجال الأغذية الريولوجي حاجة مهمة جدا لأن قوام المادة الغذائية هي تعتبر من مواصفات الجودة للمنتج فبالتالي احنا محتاجين ان احنا نعرف ايه العوامل المؤثره على تغيير القوام او لزوجه المواد بتاعتنا ده بيحصل عن طريق جهاز الريوميتر ويعني لو في اي سؤال او استفسار او في حاجه مش واضحه ممكن تسالوني زي ما فهمت حضراتكم وشكرا لكم جميعا حضوركم هل في اي سؤال؟ شكرا دكتور محمد على كل جهودك معنا في المحاضرات السابقة وفي المحاضرة هذه شكرا لكل الحضور بارك الله فيكم جميعا شكرا أستاذ نور أنا بشكرك فعلا لأنك يعني بالتعاون معنا قدرت أن احنا نوصل المادة العلمية دي لعدد كبير فطبعا يعني لازم أشكر حضرتك بأن حضرتك تعاونت معنا في هذا الموضوع وبشكر جميع الحضور ان هم مواظبين على الحضور وبيحضروا معانا المحاضرات وان شاء الله اتمنى اشوفكم في المحاضره القادمه باذن الله هبعت لكم كل التفاصيل على الواتساب جروب وعلى الايميلز وانا الحمد لله حليت مشكله تسجيل المحاضره من ابتداء من المحاضره اللي فاتت وانا سجلتها وارسلتها على الواتساب جروب 
وبرضه المحاضره دي بتتسجل وهبعتها لكم هي والبي دي اف برزنتيشن ثانك يو فيري ماتش ماركوس وي ريلي لايكت يور برزنتيشن And please, uh, after the presentation, please send the presentation PDF to my email so that I can forward to the customers. Uh, thank you very much uh, for giving your time and effort presenting this uh, session. And we are coming to the end of the presentation. Thank you all and uh, goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you from my side as well. Thank you, Marcus. You're welcome. Thank you. شكرا للقائمين على ألف شكر